How to get anything you want from anybody? Well, at least have the best crack at it. Have you ever admired those successful people who seem to have it all? You see them chatting confidently at business meetings or comfortably at social parties. They're the ones with the best jobs, the nicest spouses, the finest friends, the biggest bank accounts, or the most fashionable zip codes. But wait a minute, a lot of them aren't smarter than you. They're not more educated than you. They're not even better looking. So what is it? Some people suspect they inherited it. Others say they married it or were just plain lucky. Tell them to think again. What it boils down to is their more skillful way of dealing with fellow human beings. You see, nobody gets to the top alone. Over the years, people who seem to have it all have captured the hearts and conquered the minds of hundreds of others who helped boost them rung by rung to the top of whatever corporate or social ladder they chose. Wannabes wandering around at the foot of the ladder often gaze up and grouse that the big boys and big girls at the top are snobs when big players don't give them their friendship, love, or business, they call them cliquish or accuse them of belonging to an old boy network. Some grumble that they hit their heads against a glass ceiling. The complaining little leaguers never realize the rejection was their own fault. They'll never know they blew the affair, the friendship, or the deal because of their own communications fumbles. It's as though well-liked people have a bag of tricks, a magic, or a Midas touch that turns everything they do into success. What's in their bag of tricks? You'll find a lot of things. A substance that solidifies friendship, a wizardry that wins minds, and a magic that makes people fall in love with them. They also possess a quality that makes bosses hire and then promote, a characteristic that keeps clients coming back, and an asset that makes customers buy from them and not the competition. We all have a few of those tricks in our bags, some more than others. Those with a whole lot of them are big winners in life. How to Talk to Anyone gives you 92 of these little tricks that they use every day so you too can play the game to perfection and get whatever you want in life. How the Little Tricks Were Unveiled Many years ago, a drama teacher exasperated at my bad acting in a college play shouted, No, no, your body's belying your words. Every tiny movement, every body position he held, divulges your private thoughts. Your face can make 7,000 different expressions, and each exposes precisely who you are and what you are thinking at any particular moment. Then he said something I'll never forget. And your body, the way you move, is your autobiography in motion. How right he was. On the stage of real life, every physical move you make subliminally tells everyone in eyeshot the story of your life. Two people getting to know each other are like little puppies sniffing each other out. We don't have tails that wag or hair that bristles, but we do have eyes that narrow or widen, and hands that flash knuckles or subconsciously soften in the palms up I submit position. We have dozens of other involuntary reactions that take place in the first few moments of togetherness. Attorneys conducting voir dire are exquisitely aware of this. They pay close attention to your instinctive body reactions. They watch to see how fully you are facing them and just how far forward or back you're leaning while answering their questions. They check out your hands. Are they softly open, palms up, 
signifying acceptance of the ideas they're expressing? Or are you making a slight fist, knuckles out, signaling rejection? They scrutinize your face for the split seconds you break eye contact when discussing relevant subjects like your feelings on big awards for damages or the death penalty. Sometimes attorneys bring along a legal assistant whose sole job is to sit on the sidelines and take precise note of your every fidget. An interesting aside, trial lawyers often choose women to do this twitch and turn spying job because, traditionally, females are sharper observers of subtle body cues than males. Women, more sensitive to emotions than men, often ask their husbands, Is something bothering you, honey? These super-sensitive women accuse their husbands of being so insensitive to emotions that they wouldn't notice anything is wrong until their neckties are drenched in her tears. The attorney and the assistant then review your score on the dozens of subconscious signals you flashed. Depending on their tally, you could find yourself on jury duty or twiddling your thumbs back in the jurors waiting room. Trial lawyers are so conscious of body language that in the 1960s during the famous trial of the Chicago 7 defense attorney William Kunstler actually made a legal objection to Judge Julius Hoffman's posture. During the summation by the prosecution Judge Hoffman leaned forward which accused Kunstler, sent a message to the jury of attention and interest. During his defense summation, complained Kunstler, Judge Hoffman leaned back, sending the jury a subliminal message of disinterest. You're on trial, and you only have ten seconds. Like attorneys deciding whether they want you on their case, Everybody you meet makes a subconscious judgment on whether they want you in their lives. They base their verdict greatly on the same signals. Your body language answer to their unspoken question, Well, how do you like me so far? The first few moments of your reactions set the stage upon which the entire relationship will be played out. If you ever want anything from the new acquaintance, your unspoken answer to their unspoken question, how do you like me so far, must be, wow, I really like you. When a little four-year-old feels bashful, he slumps, puts his arms up in front of his chest, steps back, and hides behind mommy's skirt. However, when little Johnny sees daddy come home, he runs up to him, he smiles, his eyes get wide and he opens his arms for a hug. A loving child's body is like a tiny flower bud unfolding to the sunshine. Twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years of life on earth make little difference. When forty-year-old Johnny is feeling timid, he slumps and folds his arms in front of his chest. When he wants to reject a salesman or business colleague, he turns away and closes them off with a myriad of body signals. However, when welcoming his loved one home after an absence, Big Johnny opens his body to her like a giant daffodil spreading its petals to the sun after a rainstorm. Treat people like big babies. Once I was at a corporate star-studded party with an attractive recently divorced friend of mine. Carla had been a copywriter with one of the leading advertising agencies which, like so many companies then, had downsized. My girlfriend was both out of work and out of a relationship. At this particular party, the pickings for Carla were good, both personally and professionally. Several times as Carla and I stood talking, one good-looking corporate male beast or another would find himself within a few feet of us. More often than not, one of these desirable males would flash his teeth at Carla. She sometimes graced the tentatively courting male with a quick smile over her shoulder, but then she'd turn back to our mundane conversation as though she were hanging on my every word. 
I knew she was trying not to look anxious, but inside Carla was crying out, Why doesn't he come speak to us? Right after one prize corporate big cat smiled, but because of Carla's minimal reaction, wandered back into the social jungle, I had to say, Carla, do you know who that was? He's the head of the Young and Rubicam in Paris. They're looking for copywriters willing to relocate. And he's single. Carla moaned. Just then we heard a little voice down by Carla's left knee. Hello. We looked down simultaneously. Little five-year-old Willie, the hostess's adorable young son, was tugging on Carla's skirt, obviously craving attention. Well, 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 Carla cried out, a big smile erupting all over her face. Carla turned toward him. Carla kneeled down, touched little Willie's elbow, and crooned, Well, hello there, Willie. How are you enjoying Mommy's nice party? Technique number one, the flooding smile. Don't flash an immediate smile when you greet someone, as though anyone who walked into your line of sight would be the beneficiary. Instead, look at the other person's face for a second. Pause. Soak in their persona. Then let a big, warm, responsive smile flood over your face and overflow into your eyes. It will engulf the recipient like a warm wave. The split-second delay convinces people your flooding smile is genuine and only for them. Let us now travel but a few inches north to two of the most powerful communications tools you possess, your eyes. 2. How to strike everyone as intelligent and insightful by using your eyes. It's only a slight exaggeration to say Helen of Troy could launch ships with her eyes and Davy Crockett could stare down a bear. Your eyes are personal grenades that have the power to detonate people's emotions. Just as martial arts masters register their fists as lethal weapons, you can register your eyes as psychological lethal weapons when you master the following eye contact techniques. Beloved people in the game of life look beyond the conventional wisdom that teaches keep good eye contact. For one, they understand that to certain suspicious or insecure people, intense eye contact can be a virulent intrusion. When I was growing up, my family had a Haitian housekeeper whose fantasies were filled with witches, warlocks, and black magic. Zola refused to be left alone in a room with Louis, my Siamese cat. Louis looks right through me, sees my soul, she'd whisper to me fearfully. In some cultures, intense eye contact is sorcery. In others, staring at someone can be threatening or disrespectful. Realizing this, big players in the international scene prefer to pack a book on cultural body language differences in their carry-on rather than a Berlitz phrase book. In our culture, however, big winners know exaggerated eye contact can be extremely advantageous, especially between the sexes. In business, even when romance is not in the picture, Strong eye contact packs a powerful wallop between men and women. A Boston Center conducted a study to learn the precise effect. The researchers asked opposite-sex individuals to have a two-minute casual conversation. They tricked half their subjects into maintaining intense eye contact by directing them to count the number of times their partner blinked. They gave the other half of the subjects no special eye contact directions for the chat. When they questioned the subjects afterward, the unsuspecting blinkers reported significantly higher feelings of respect and fondness for their colleagues, who, unbeknownst to them, had simply been counting their blinks. I've experienced the closeness intense eye contact engenders with a stranger firsthand. Once, when giving a seminar to several hundred people, one woman's face in the crowd caught my attention. 
the participant's appearance was not particularly unique, yet she became the focus of my attention throughout my talk. Why? Because not for one moment did she take her eyes off my face. Even when I finished making a point and was silent, her eyes stayed hungrily on my face. I sensed she couldn't wait to savor the next insight to spout from my lips. I loved it. Her concentration and obvious fascination inspired me to remember stories and make important points I had long forgotten. Right after my talk, I resolved to seek out this new friend who was so enthralled by my speech. As people were leaving the hall, I quickly sidled up behind my big fan. Excuse me, I said. My fan kept walking. Excuse me, I repeated a tad louder. My admirer didn't vary her pace as she continued out the door. I followed her into the corridor and tapped her shoulder gently. This time she whirled around with a surprised look on her face. I mumbled some excuse about my appreciating her concentration on my talk and wanting to ask her a few questions. Did you uh, get much out of the seminar? I ventured. Well, not really, she answered candidly. I had difficulty understanding what you were saying because you were walking around on the platform facing different directions. In a heartbeat, I understood. The woman was hearing impaired. I did not captivate her as I had suspected. She was not intrigued by my talk as I had hoped. The only reason she kept her eyes glued on my face was because she was struggling to read my lips. Nevertheless, her eye contact had given me such pleasure and inspiration during my talk that, tired as I was, I asked her to join me for coffee. I spent the next hour recapping my entire seminar just for her. Powerful stuff, this eye contact. Make your eyes look even more intelligent. There is yet another argument for intense eye contact. In addition to awakening feelings of respect and affection, maintaining strong eye contact gives you the impression of being an intelligent and abstract thinker. Because abstract thinkers integrate incoming data more easily than concrete thinkers, they can continue looking into someone's eyes even during the silences. Their thought processes are not distracted by peering into their partner's peepers. Back to our valiant psychologists. Yale researchers, thinking they had the unswerving truth about eye contact, conducted another study that they assumed would confirm the more eye contact, the more positive feelings. This time they directed subjects to deliver a personally revealing monologue. They asked the listeners to react with a sliding scale of eye contact while their partners talked. The results? All went as expected when women told their personal stories to women. Increased eye contact encouraged feelings of intimacy. But whoops, it wasn't so with the men. Some men felt hostile when stared at too long by another man. Other men felt threatened. Some few even suspected their partner was more interested than he should be and wanted to slug him. Your partner's emotional reaction to your profound gaze has a biological base. When you look intently at someone, it increases their heartbeat and shoots an adrenaline-like substance gushing through their veins. This is the same physical reaction people have when they start to fall in love. And when you consciously increase your eye contact, even during normal business or social interaction, people will feel they have captivated you. Men talking to women and women talking to men or women use the following technique, which I call sticky eyes, for the joy of the recipient and for your own advantage. Guys, I'll have a man-to-man -man modification of this technique for you in a moment. How to look like a big winner wherever you go. Do you remember the lyrics to the old Shirley Bassey song? The minute you walked in the joint, I could see you were a man of distinction, a real big spender. 
good looking, so refined. Say, wouldn't you like to know what's going on in my mind? The goal of this first section is not to make you look like a real big spender. Rather, it is to give you the cachet of a real big somebody the moment people lay eyes on you. To that end, we now explore the most important technique to make you look like a very important person. When the doctor smacks your knee with that nasty little hammer, your foot jerks forward. Thus the phrase knee jerk reaction. Your body has another instinctive reaction. When a big jolt of happiness hits your heart and you feel like a winner, your head jerks up automatically and you throw your shoulders back. A smile frames your lips and softens your eyes. This is the look winners have constantly. They stand with assurance. They move with confidence. They smile softly with pride. No doubt about it. Good posture symbolizes that you are a man or woman who is used to being on top. Obviously, millions of mothers sticking their knuckles between their kids' shoulder blades and trillions of teachers telling students, stand up straight, hasn't done the trick. We are a nation of slouchers. We need a technique more stern than teachers and more persuasive than parents to make us stand like a somebody. In one profession, perfect posture, perfect equilibrium, perfect balance is not only desirable, it's a matter of life and death. One false move, one slump of the shoulders, one hangdog look can mean curtains for the high wire acrobat. I'll never forget the first time Mama took me to the circus. When seven men and women raced into the center ring, the crowd rose as though they were all joined at the hips. They cheered with one thunderous voice. Mama pressed her lips against my ear and reverently whispered these were the great Walendas, the only troupe in the world to perform the seven-person pyramid without a net. In an instant, the crowd became hushed. Not a cough or soda slurp was heard in the big top as Carl and Herman Wallenda shouted cues in German to their trusting relatives. The family meticulously and majestically ascended into the position of a human pyramid. They then balanced precariously on a thin wire hundreds of feet above the hard dirt with no net between them and sudden death. The vision was unforgettable. To me, equally unforgettable was the beauty and grace of the seven Walendas racing into the center of the big top to take their bows, each perfectly aligned, head high, shoulders back, standing so tall it still didn't seem like their feet were touching the ground. Every muscle in their bodies defined pride, success, and their joy of being alive. Still, here is a visualization technique to get your body looking like a winner who is in the habit of feeling that pride, success, and joy of being alive. Your posture is your biggest success barometer. Imagine you are a world-renowned acrobat, master of the Iron Jaw Act, waiting in the wings of the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. Soon you will dart into the center ring to captivate the crowd with the precision and balance of your body. Before walking through any door, the door to your office, a party, a meeting, even your kitchen, picture a leather bit hanging by a cable from the frame. It is swinging just an inch higher than your head. As you pass through the door, Throw your head back and chomp on the imaginary dental grip that first pulls your cheeks back into a smile and then lifts you up. As you ascend high above the gasping crowd, your body is stretched into perfect alignment. Head high, shoulders back, torso out of hips, feet weightless. At the zenith of the tent, you spin like a graceful top to the amazement and admiration of the crowd craning their necks to watch you. Now you look like a somebody. One day, to test hang by your teeth, I decided to count how many times I walked through a doorway. 
60 times, even at home. You calculate. Twice out your front door, twice in, six times to the bathroom, eight times to the kitchen, and through countless doors at your office. It adds up. Visualize anything 60 times a day and it becomes a habit. Habitual good posture is the first mark of a big winner. You are now ready to float into the room to captivate the crowd or close the sale, or maybe just settle for looking like the most important somebody in the room. You now have all the basics Bob the Artist needs to portray you as a big winner. Like he said, great posture, a heads-up look, a confident smile, and a direct gaze. The ideal image for somebody who's a somebody. Technique number four, hang by your teeth. Visualize a circus iron jaw bit hanging from the frame of every door you walk through. Take a bite, and with it firmly between your teeth, let it swoop you to the peak of the big top. When you hang by your teeth, every muscle is stretched into perfect posture position. Now let's put the whole act into motion. It's time to turn your attention outward to your conversation partner. Use the next two techniques to make him or her feel like a million. 5. How to win their heart by responding to their inner infant. Remember the old joke? The comic comes on stage and the first words out of his mouth are, Well, how do you like me so far? The audience always cracks up. Why? Because we all silently ask that question. Whenever we meet someone, we know, consciously or subconsciously, how they're reacting to us. Do they look at us? Do they smile? Do they lean toward us? Do they somehow recognize how wonderful and special we are? We like those people. They have good taste. Or do they turn away, obviously unimpressed by our magnificence? The Cretans? Dogs hear sounds our ears can't detect. Bats see shapes in the darkness that elude our eyes. And people make moves that are beneath human consciousness, but have tremendous power to attract or repel. Every smile, every frown, every syllable you utter, or every arbitrary choice of word that passes between your lips, can draw others toward you or make them want to run away. Men, did your gut feeling ever tell you to jump ship on a deal? Women, did your women's intuition make you accept or reject an offer? On a conscious level, we may not be aware of what the hunch is. But like the ear of the dog or the eye of the bat, the elements that make up subliminal sentiments are very real. Imagine, please, Two humans in a complex box wired with circuits to record all the signals flowing between the two. As many as 10,000 units of information flow per second. Probably the lifetime efforts of roughly half the adult population of the United States would be required to sort the units in one hour's interaction between two subjects a University of Pennsylvania Communications Authority estimates. With the zillions of subtle actions and reactions zapping back and forth between two human beings, can we come up with concrete techniques to make our every communication clear, confident, credible, and charismatic? Determined to find the answer, I read practically every book written on communication skills, on charisma, and chemistry between people. I explored hundreds of studies conducted around the world on what qualities made up leadership and credibility. Intrepid social scientists left no stone unturned in their quest to find the formula. For example, optimistic Chinese researchers Hoping charisma might be in the diet, 
went so far as to compare the relationship of personality type to the catecholamine level in subjects' urine. Needless to say, their thesis was soon shelved. Bill Carnegie was great for the 20th century, but this is the 21st. Most studies simply confirm Dale Carnegie's 1936 classic, How to Win Friends and Influence People. His wisdom for the ages said success lay in smiling, showing interest in other people, and making them feel good about themselves. That's no surprise, I thought. It's as true today as it was more than 70 years ago. So, if Bill Carnegie and hundreds of others since have offered the same astute advice, why do we need another book telling us how to win friends and influence people? Two mammoth reasons. Reason one. Suppose a sage told you, when in China speak Chinese, but gave you no language lessons. Dale Carnegie and many communications experts are like that sage. They tell us what to do, but not how to do it. In today's sophisticated world, it's not enough to say smile or give sincere compliments. Cynical business people today see more subtleties in your smile, more complexities in your compliment. Accomplished or attractive people are surrounded by smiling sycophants feigning interest and fawning all over them. Prospects are tired of salespeople who say, Oh, that suit looks great on you, when their fingers are caressing cash register keys. Women are wary of suitors saying, You are beautiful, when the bedroom door is in view. Reason 2. The world is a very different place than it was in 1936, and we need a new formula for success. To find it, I observed the superstars of today. I explored the techniques used by top salespeople to close the sale, speakers to convince, clergy to convert, performers to engross, sex symbols to seduce, and athletes to win. I found concrete building blocks to the elusive qualities that lead to their success. Then I broke them down into easily digestible, news-you-can-use techniques. I gave each a name that will quickly come to mind when you find yourself in a communications conundrum. As I developed the techniques, I began sharing them with audiences around the country. Participants in my communication seminars gave me their ideas. My clients, many of them CEOs of Fortune 500 companies, enthusiastically offered their observations. When I was in the presence of the most successful and beloved leaders, I analyzed their body language and their facial expressions. I listened carefully to their casual conversations, their timing, and their choice of words. I watched as they dealt with their families, friends, associates, and adversaries. Every time I detected a little nip of magic in their communicating, I asked them to pluck it out with tweezers and expose it to the bright light of consciousness. We analyzed it together, and then I turned it into an easy-to-do little trick others could duplicate and profit from. My findings and the strokes of some of those very effective folks are in this book. Some are subtle, some are surprising, but all are achievable. When you master them, everyone from new acquaintances to family, friends, and business associates will happily open their hearts, homes, companies, and even wallets to give you whatever they can. There's a bonus. As you sail through life with your new communication skills, you will look back and see some very happy givers smiling in your wake. Part 1. How to intrigue everyone without saying a word. You only have 10 seconds to show you're a somebody.
The exact moment that two humans lay eyes on each other has awesome potency. The first side of you is a brilliant holograph. It burns its way into your new acquaintance's eyes and can stay emblazoned in his or her memory forever. Artists are sometimes able to capture this quicksilver, fleeting emotional response. My friend Robert Grossman is an accomplished caricature artist who draws regularly for Forbes, Newsweek, Sports Illustrated, Rolling Stone, and other popular publications. Bob has a unique gift for capturing not only the physical appearance of his subjects, but for zeroing in on the essence of their personalities. The bodies and souls of hundreds of luminaries radiate from his sketch pad. One glance at his caricatures of famous people and you can actually see their personalities. Sometimes at a party, Bob will do a quick sketch on a cocktail napkin of a guest. Hovering over Bob's shoulder, the onlookers gasp as they watch their friend's image and essence materialize before their eyes. When he's finished drawing, he puts his pen down and hands the napkin to the subject. Often a puzzled look comes over the subject's face. He or she usually mumbles some politeness like, Well, uh, that's great, but it really isn't me. The crowd's convincing crescendo of, oh yes it is, drowns the subject out and squelches any lingering doubt. The confused subject is left to stare back at the world's view of himself or herself in the napkin. Once, when I was visiting Bob's studio, I asked him how he could capture people's personalities so well. He said, It's simple. I just look at them. No, I asked. How do you capture their personalities? Don't you have to do a lot of research about their lifestyle, their history? No, I told you, Leal, I just look at them. Huh? He went on to explain, Almost every facet of people's personalities is evident from their appearance, their posture, the way they move. For instance, he said, calling me over to a file where he kept his caricatures of political figures. See, Bob said, pointing to angles on various presidential body parts. Here's the boyishness of Clinton, showing me his half-smile, the awkwardness of the elder George Bush, pointing to his shoulder angle, the charm of Reagan, noting the ex-president's smiling eyes, the shiftiness of Nixon, pointing to the furtive tilt of his head. Digging a little deeper into his file, he pulled out Franklin Delano Roosevelt and pointing to the nose high in the air, here's the pride of FDR. It's all in the face and the body. First impressions are indelible. Why? because in our fast-paced information overload world of multiple stimuli bombarding us every second, people's heads are spinning. They must form quick judgments to make sense of the world and get on with what they have to do. So whenever people meet you, they take an instant mental snapshot. That image of you becomes the data they deal with for a very long time. Your body shrieks before your lips can speak. Are their data accurate? Amazingly enough, yes. Even before your lips part and the first syllable escapes, the essence of you has already axed its way into their brains. The way you look and the way you move is more than 80% of someone's first impression of you. Not one word need be spoken. I've lived and worked in countries where I didn't speak the native language. Yet without one understandable syllable spoken between us, the years proved my first impressions were on target. Whenever I met new colleagues, I could tell instantly how friendly they felt toward me, how confident they were, and approximately how much stature they had in the company. I could sense just from seeing them move who the heavyweights were and who were the welterweights. I have no extrasensory skill. You'd know too. How? Because before you have had time to process a rational thought, you get a sixth sense about someone. 
Studies have shown emotional reactions occur even before the brain is at time to register what's causing their reaction. Thus, the moment someone looks at you, he or she experiences a massive hit, the impact of which lays the groundwork for the entire relationship. Bob told me he captures that first hit in creating his caricatures. Deciding to pursue my own agenda for how to talk to anyone, I asked, Bob, if you wanted to portray somebody really cool, you know, intelligent, strong, charismatic, principled, fascinating, caring, interested in other people. Easy, Bob interrupted. He knew precisely what I was getting at. Just give him great posture, a heads-up look, a confident smile, and a direct gaze. It's the ideal image for somebody who's a somebody. How to look like a somebody. My friend Karen is a highly respected professional in the home furnishings business. Her husband is an equally big name in the communications field. They have two small sons. Whenever Karen is at a home furnishings industry event, everyone pays deference to her. She's a very important person in that world. Her colleagues at conventions jostle for position just to be seen casually chatting with her and, they hope, be photographed rubbing elbows with her for industry bibles like Home Furnishings Executive and Furniture World. Yet, Karen complains, when she accompanies her husband to communications functions, she might as well be a nobody. When she takes her kids to school functions, she's just another mom. She once asked me, Leal, how can I stand out from the crowd so people who don't know me will approach me and at least assume I'm an interesting person? The techniques in this section accomplish precisely that. When you use the next nine techniques, you will come across as a special person to everyone you meet. You will stand out as a somebody in whatever crowd you find yourself in, even if it's not your crowd. Let's start with your smile. Technique number two, sticky eyes. Pretend your eyes are glued to your conversation partners with sticky warm taffy. Don't break eye contact even after he or she has finished speaking. When you must look away, do it ever so slowly, reluctantly, stretching the gooey taffy until the tiny string finally breaks. What about guys' eyes? Now, gentlemen, when talking to men, you too can use sticky eyes. Just make them a little less sticky when discussing personal matters with other men, lest your listener feel threatened or misinterpret your intentions. But do increase your eye contact slightly more than normal with men on day-to-day -day communications, and a lot more when talking to women. It broadcasts a visceral message of comprehension and respect. I have a friend, Sammy, a salesman who unwittingly comes across as an arrogant chap. He doesn't mean to, but sometimes his brusque manner makes it look like he's running roughshod over people's feelings. Once, while we were having dinner together in a restaurant, I told him about the sticky eyes technique. I guess he took it to heart. When the waiter came over, Sammy, uncharacteristically, instead of bluntly blurting out his order with his nose in the menu, looked at the waiter. He smiled, gave his order for the appetizer, and kept his eyes on the waiters for an extra second before looking down again at the menu to choose the main dish. I can't tell you how different Sammy seemed to me just then. He came across as a sensitive and caring man, and all it took was two extra seconds of eye contact. I saw the effect it had on the waiter, too. We received exceptionally gracious service the rest of the evening. A week later, Sammy called me and said, Leal Sticky Eyes has changed my life. I've been following it to a T. With women, I make my eyes real sticky, and with men, slightly sticky. And now everybody's treating me with such deference. 
I think it's part of the reason I've made more sales this week than all last month. If you deal with customers or clients in your professional life, Sticky Eyes is a definite boon to your bottom line. To most people in our culture, profound eye contact signals trust, knowledge, and I'm here for you attitude. Let's carry Sticky Eyes one step further. Like a potent medicine that has the power to kill or cure, the next eye contact technique has the potential to captivate or annihilate. 3. How to use your eyes to make someone fall in love with you. Now we haul in the heavy eyeball artillery. Very sticky eyes or super glue eyes. Let's call them epoxy eyes. Big bosses use epoxy eyes to evaluate employees. Police investigators use epoxy eyes to intimidate suspected criminals. And clever Romeos use epoxy eyes to make women fall in love with them. If romance is your goal, epoxy eyes is a proven aphrodisiac. The epoxy eyes technique takes at least three people to pull off. You, your target, and one other person. Here's how it works. Usually when you're chatting with two or more people, you gaze at the person who is speaking. However, the epoxy eyes technique suggests you concentrate on the listener, your target, rather than the speaker. This slightly disorients the target, and he or she silently asks, why is this person looking at me instead of the speaker? Your target senses you are extremely interested in his or her reactions. This can be beneficial in certain business situations when it is appropriate that you judge the listener. Human resources professionals often use epoxy eyes not as a technique but because they are sincerely interested in a prospective employee's reaction to certain ideas being presented. Attorneys, bosses, police investigators, psychologists, and others who must examine subjects' reactions also use epoxy eyes for analytical purposes. When you use epoxy eyes, it sends out signals of interest blended with complete confidence in yourself. But because epoxy eyes puts you in a position of evaluating or judging someone else, you must be careful. Don't overdo it or you could come across as arrogant and brazen. Technique number three, epoxy eyes. This brazen technique packs a powerful punch. Watch your target person even when someone else is talking. No matter who is speaking, keep looking at the man or woman you want to impact. Sometimes using full epoxy eyes is too potent so here is a gentler yet effective form. Watch the speaker but let your glance bounce to your target each time the speaker finishes a point. This way Mr. or Ms. Target still feels you are intrigued by his or her reactions, yet there is relief from the intensity. Use epoxy eyes to push their erotic button. If romance is on the horizon, Epoxy eyes transmits yet another message. It says, I can't take my eyes off you, or I only have eyes for you. Anthropologists have dubbed eyes the initial organ of romance, because studies show intense eye contact plays havoc with our heartbeat. It also releases a drug-like substance into our nervous system called phenylethylamine. Since this is the hormone detected in the human body during erotic excitement, intense eye contact can be a turn-on. Men, epoxy eyes is extremely effective on women, if they find you attractive. The lady interprets her nervous reaction to your untoward gaze as budding infatuation. If she does not like you, however, your epoxy eyes is downright obnoxious. Never use epoxy eyes on strangers in public settings or you could get arrested. 4. 1. 
How to Make Your Smile Magically Different In 1936, one of Dale Carnegie's six musts in how to win friends and influence people was smile. His edict has been echoed each decade by practically every communications guru who ever put pen to paper or mouth to microphone. However, at the turn of the millennium, it's high time we re-examine the role of the smile in high-level human relations. When you dig deeper into Dale's dictum, you'll find a 1936 quick smile doesn't always work, especially nowadays. The old-fashioned instant grin carries no weight with today's sophisticated crowd. Look at world leaders, negotiators, and corporate giants. Not a smiling sycophant among them. Key players in all walks of life enrich their smile, so when it does erupt, it has more potency and the world smiles with them. Researchers have cataloged dozens of different types of smiles. They range from the tight rubber band of a trapped liar to the soft, squishy smile of a tickled infant. Some smiles are warm, while others are cold. There are real smiles and fake smiles. You've seen plenty of those plastered on the faces of friends who say they're delighted you decided to drop by, and presidential candidates visiting your city who say they're thrilled to be in, uh, uh. Big winners know their smile is one of their most powerful weapons, so they've fine-tuned it for maximum impact. How to fine-tune your smile. Just last year, my old college friend Missy took over her family business, a Midwestern company supplying corrugated boxes to manufacturers. One day she called saying she was coming to New York to court new clients, and she invited me to dinner with several of her prospects. I was looking forward to once again seeing my friend's quicksilver smile and hearing her contagious laugh. Missy was an incurable giggler, and that was part of her charm. When her dad passed away last year, she told me she was taking over the business. I thought Missy's personality was a little bubbly to be a CEO in a tough business. But hey, what do I know about the corrugated box biz? She, three of her potential clients, and I met in the cocktail lounge of a midtown restaurant and, as we led them into the dining room, Missy whispered in my ear, Please call me Melissa tonight. Of course, I winked back. Not many company presidents are called Missy. Soon after the Metro D seated us, I began noticing Melissa was a very different woman from the giggling girl I'd known in college. She was just as charming. She smiled as much as ever. Yet something was different. I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Although she was still effervescent, I had the distinct impression everything Melissa said was more insightful and sincere. She was responding with genuine warmth to her prospective clients, and I could tell they liked her too. I was thrilled because my friend was scoring a knockout that night. By the end of the evening, Melissa had three big new clients. Afterward, alone with her in the cab, I said, Missy, you've really come a long way since you took over the company. Your whole personality has developed, well, a really cool, sharp corporate edge. Uh-uh, only one thing has changed, she said. What's that? My smile, she said. Your what? I asked incredulously. My smile, she repeated as though I hadn't heard her. You see, she said, with a distant look coming into her eyes. When Dad got sick and knew in a few years I'd have to take over the business, he sat me down and had a life-changing conversation with me. I'll never forget his words. Dad said, Missy, honey, remember that old song, I love you, honey, but your feet's too big? Well, if you're going to make it big in the box business, let me say, I love you, honey, but your smile's too quick. 
He then brought out a yellowed newspaper article quoting a study he'd been saving to show me when the time was right. It concerned women in business. The study showed women who were slower to smile in corporate life were perceived as more credible. As Missy talked, I began to think about history-making women like Margaret Thatcher, Indira Gandhi, Golda Meir, Madeleine Albright, and other powerful women of their ilk. Not one was known for her quick smile. Missy continued, The study went on to say a big warm smile is an asset, but only when it comes a little slower, because then it has more credibility. From that moment on, Missy explained, she gave clients and business associates her big smile. However, she trained her lips to erupt more slowly. Thus, her smile appeared more sincere and personalized for the recipient. That was it. Missy's slower smile gave her personality a richer, deeper, more sincere cachet. Though the delay was less than a second, the recipients of her big, beautiful smile felt it was special and just for them. I decided to do more research on the smile. When you're in the market for shoes, you begin to look at everyone's feet. When you decide to change your hairstyle, you look at everyone's haircut. Well, for several months, I became a steady smile watcher. I watched smiles on the street. I watched smiles on TV. I watched the smiles of politicians, the clergy, corporate giants, and world leaders. My findings? Amid the sea of flashing teeth and parting lips, I discovered the people perceived to have the most credibility and integrity were just ever so slower to smile. Then, when they did, their smiles seemed to seep into every crevice of their faces and envelop them like a slow flood. Thus, I call the following technique the flooding smile. Little Willie beamed. When Little Willie finally trundled off to tug on the garments of the next group of potential attention givers, Carla and I returned to our grown-up conversing. During our chat, corporate beasts continued to stalk Carla with their eyes, and she continued casting half-smiles at them. She was obviously disappointed none of them was making a further approach. I had to bite my tongue. Finally, when I felt it was going to bleed from the pressure of my teeth, I said, Carla, have you been noticing that four or five men have come over and smiled at you? Yes, Carla whispered, her eyes darting nervously around the room lest anyone overhear us. And you've been giving them little half smiles, I continued. Yes, she murmured, now confused at my question. Remember when little Willie came up and tugged on your skirt? Do you recall how you smiled, that beautiful big smile of yours, turned toward him and welcomed him into our grown-up conversation? Yes, she answered haltingly. Well, I have a request, Carla. I want you to give the next man who smiles at you that same big smile you gave Willie. I want you to turn toward him just like you did then. Maybe even reach out and touch his arm like you did Willie's, and then welcome him into our conversation. Oh, Leal, I couldn't do that. Carla, do it. Sure enough, within a few minutes, another attractive man wandered our way and smiled. Carla played her role to perfection. She flashed her beautiful teeth turned fully toward him and said, Hello, come join us. He wasted no time accepting Carla's invitation. After a few moments, I excused myself. Neither noticed my departure because they were in animated conversation. The last glimpse I had of my friend at the party was her floating out the door on the arm of her new friend. Just then, the technique I call the Big Baby Pivot was born. It is a skill that will help you win whatever your heart desires from whatever type of beasts you encounter in the social or corporate jungle. Technique number five, the Big Baby Pivot. 
Give everyone you meet the big baby pivot. The instant the two of you are introduced, reward your new acquaintance. Give the warm smile, the total body turn, and the undivided attention you would give a tiny tyke who crawled up to your feet, turned a precious face up to yours, and beamed a big toothless grin. Pivoting 100% toward the new person shouts, I think you are very, very special.